good evening everybody uh <clears throat> i'm more than happy to take questions at the end and uh i'm i'll try and answer them uh this is a kind of this is a work in progress very much at the moment it's uh something I, a farm i've known about for a long time but only really got stuck into the whole study uh last year when i met a member of the family that lives there um and found out to my surprise that it, the, the I knew the farm buildings had been moved, but they see actually the same people are actually I'm not the same people, but their their descendants are still farming there. So I mean immediately that fascinated me. But the next stage was even more fascinating because they then told me that they had actually drawings of the building before it was actually taken down. So I my uh, ears pricked up. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. Yes, sir. And said the lady, we've got them in the bottom drawer or something like that. And I thought, oh. so since then, I've um, been round several times and had a look at the drawings. And I also discovered, which is, uh, again, a huge bonus, is that the drawings of the new farm are also in the West Yorkshire archives in Halifax. So I thought all oh, my Christmases have come at once. It's suddenly I've got all these buildings I can have a look at and all these uh, all these drawings and things I can uh, do a kind of a history of the building or buildings, I should say more accurately. And that's where this talk has come from. I've already done one talk based on all this um, to the local people around here. In, um, I live near Mythamroyd and the farm is literally just over the hill from me. and. I gave a talk, but I've uh, this isn't the same talk. I thought I would originally do the same talk, but I've decided that the talk I gave was too lent too much on the sort of local history and the family, and it wasn't enough about the uh, about the buildings themselves. So I've tweaked it, and I've gone on tweaking it until about three o'clock this afternoon. So hopefully, um, I don't know if it, if it works or not, but we'll. We'll see. We'll have a go and uh, see what it's like. So this is just to give you an idea of the kind of uh, kind of area we're talking about. We're in we're in the upland uh, South Pennines, um, fairly an interesting area, an area that's got uh, a lot of uh, different features. Um, this is the track that actually leads down to a farm or a, a, the, a farm just above uh, the buildings we're going to be looking at called Dunkirk which gives a clue probably to its age. <clears throat> anyway, let's get started. So this is the building uh, and in an illustration uh, by a chap called John Leyland, who is quite well known as an artist in, in the Halifax area. And he went round drawing buildings of uh, the area, which he thought looked impressive and published them in this views of the ancient buildings you can read it there on the right, um, in 1878. And one of them that featured there was Holin Hay. And you look at that picture and you wow, that's an amazing looking building. Can it really have been like that? Um, and I have to say that some of his drawings um, are, inter are very interpretative, like he's got one or two interiors, how he thought they would be. But it appears, looking at this one, and I, if you look at it quite carefully, take in all the details, um, that he got them um, more or less right, or more or less right, because lo and behold, we also have in the Pennine Heritage Digital Archive um, a picture, photograph, um, originally published by Kershaw and Ashworth, Hebden Bridge. They were the publishers of the Hebden Bridge Times, um, Todmut and Advertiser, one or two other local papers. And for some reason, they published a picture of this building. I haven't actually been able to find it in any of the newspapers, uh, but uh, that for some reason they have it. And there it is, the building in all its glory. And it, that must be um, in, I would have thought, in the uh, uh, 1890s at some stage. I mean, it's a very evocative picture with the lady standing at the door in her long pinny. And is who is this at the front sitting on down on the step? Is it granddad, possibly, cradling the baby? Several features of the building that are, are worth a look at, and we could have a, you could spend, you know, quite a long time just talking at this. Um, one of the things I found very interesting is that on the right-hand side here, we can see a doorway, and a doorway with, if you look at them very carefully, you've got these single-piece, big single-piece surrounds, um, which 
for me, a typical of the 18th or early 19th century. Um, and a lot of the big houses in this area um, became, they were no longer fashionable as farm as places to live or as uh, useful as farmhouses even. And what happened to them was that they were subdivided. And that to me is immediately a clue on the right hand side there that that, this, that has happened to this building here. The second thing that looks a little bit odd is that the hood moulding, these areas above the windows there, uh, they're okay on this window, they're okay on that one. But here, for some reason, this doorway seems to come into the hood mould there. I mean, maybe it's meant to be like that. Maybe it was always like that. Um, but it does look a little bit odd. And we'll have a look in a minute and in that in a bit more detail. So just to compare the two, I mean, it's like spot the difference, isn't it? We're going to draw a little circle around each of the bits that are different. Um, I th think there, is, there isn't very much different that you can see. I think... Uh, Mr. Leyland got the drawing pretty accurate. I know the one thing that, um, I don't know if it's so obvious, but jumped out to me was you have on the first floor, you've got these small windows here. This one here on Mr. Um, Mr. Leyland's drawing it's been, has been blocked by the time this photograph is taken. Very interesting. I mean, it's su such a detail could actually be captured like that between these two drawings. So this one from the late 1870s and this one from the uh, mid uh, 1890s. So let's carry on. Find out where we are. Oh yes, there we are. So this is the Calder Valley coming, running up to Hebden Bridge there, um, carrying on towards Todmorden there. Here's my um <clears throat> and uh, the circle area is where this farm is. This is where Hollin Hay Farm is. I've shown it like that with the old township boundaries on now. The parish of Halifax, huge parish, the ancient parish of Halifax, was divided up into these 22 or 23 townships. Uh, Hollins was in one of the biggest ones um, called Sorby, um, and it, it was a large area that um, spread from Sorby Village, surprise, surprise, which is down here, um, all the way up to Erringdon, which is on the other side of the Crag Vale. And this south flowing stream which runs oh, sorry which runs into the um <clears throat> sorry i can't get for some reason i couldn't go backwards then bear with there um the south flowing stream is the uh, the crag brook or the turvin brook it is sometimes called it's a tributary of the river calder and the farm that we're going to be looking at is there on one of the upland on the um west no the east bank of of that river quite a few of these upland farms are built on well they're quite often they, they'll be built on a spring line the um, water supply being a key aspect of it all uh, the older ones the very old ones tend to be built just above the floodplain um, and then the uh, later ones built slightly further up the hill till you get up right up under the tops and there are some farms and the much higher areas up here most of which actually is interesting and most of them actually date from the late 16th early 17th century um and just a word about the other side of the valley um the erringdon township this whole township here uh was originally part of one of the deer parks that belonged to the manor of wakefield and the whole of almost the whole of calderdale which has become calderdale the old parish of halifax was part of this manor of Wakefield, huge area that stretched across what is today West Yorkshire. Okay, anyway, that gives you the location, an idea of uh, of uh, what the area actually looks like. Um, I thought we'd go back to one of the older maps because we have a real treasure trove of maps in the Calder Valley as well. Um, this is an extract from Meyer's map of the parish of Halifax. Again, you can see the Calder Valley running through here, uh, and beside it, I always find very interesting, the intended railway. And this is the railway line that more or less on this built on this track. It's called an intended railway at the time. It's opened five years after the map was actually made. It's the first uh, cross Pennine railway um, uh, engineered by George Stevenson, um, running between Manchester and getting up and um, going to Leeds eventually via Normand. Here's the Crag Valley, Crag Brook and that kind of thing. And uh, Hollin Hay, if you can see it, there it is. Hollin Hay is there in the middle. Have a little 
slightly <clears throat> larger version. Here's Hollin Hay. And as you can see, there are other farmsteads not far away. Dean Hay is here. Um, on top of the hill, or going further up the hill, we have a farm here called Timely Bent and Stannery End. Stannery End is a notable build, uh, farm because uh, it has associations with the coiners. Um, I'm sure many people have, would have heard of the coiners of Cragvale um, and the recent uh, televisation, that's the right word, of uh, the book by Benjamin Myers uh, called The Gallows Pole. Um, and Stannery End was one of the locations that actually featured in the story of the coiners. Uh, and indeed, one of the moulds that they used for the coining process was actually found at Stannery End and now resides in the museum up at Heptonstall. Anyway, don't let me get diverted. <clears throat> it happens easily enough. OK, our first, I don't know, interesting thing going through the newspaper archives that I discovered that um, here we have an auction date of 1894 and the auction uh, put into the Todmorden Advertiser and Hebden Bridge newsletter. Lot 7, a copyhold farm known as Great Hollin Hay near Mythamroyd, now in the occupation of Mr Jonathan Halstead as a yearly tenant. <clears throat> and it goes into the auction and then it tells us that at the very end the lot was withdrawn at a sum of £1,110. So it didn't reach, in effect, it didn't reach its reserve. And lo and behold, a second lot, a freehold and copyhold farm called Little Hollin Hay, now in the occupation of Mr Robert Halstead, so we've got Halsteads living next door to each other, um, and giving some of the details there. And that is also withdrawn. Lot seven and eight were offered together, eventually, and then they were withdrawn and at the auctioneer's bid of 1700 So an unsuccessful attempt by the, uh, by the people that own the farms to sell them. Um, but, however, they are uh, sold a year later. Here's an overall plan, which I, I suspect you probably won't be able to see very much of that on that slide. But um, Holland's, the two Holland farms... Great Hollin Hay, as it's called, that's the one we've seen the picture of already, and then Little Hollin Hay next door, and showing that the land, and it's a very interesting map because it does show that you've got effectively two farmsteads on one site, and Great Hollin Hay has the land going on, and this is at the um, northern side of the, of the divide, as it were, and on the other side, the south side, they belong to Little Hollin Hay, which is very interesting. And I suspect that probably if, if we could go back far enough, we would find that was all one all one farm. Anyway, this is the um, a document that followed on from those auction papers because um, although the lots were both withdrawn in 1894, a year later, the farms are purchased by a gentleman called Edmund Helliwell, of Edward Helliwell, I beg his pardon, of Broad Bottom. Now, Broad Bottom is uh, quite a well known building in the um, in vernacular architecture terms. It was originally um, the site of a double aisled house, a uh, timber frame double aisle house that there is actually a report now that um, in the um, Historic England archive. Um, about the original building, it was it was it's been known about for a long time, um, and Colum Giles and I uh, were um, uh, employed to do a report on the just on the timber frame bit of it because I'll show you a picture at the end. It is a very much bigger than the timber frame bit now. It's been cased in stone and then extended and extended again and so on. Anyway, this is relevant because it's Mr. Edward Helliwell of Broadbottom. A little bit about him, although I've. I, I've limited the kind of talking about the people themselves um, to this, but this, it's just worth knowing a little bit about him. Um, he's born at Walshaw, which is in the area. It's um, For those that know the area, it's the sort of kind of the top end of Hardcastle Crags. It's uh, a little settlement um, way up on the hills. He um, gets employment as an iron moulder um, at a firm in Hebden Bridge called Hartleys and Crabtrees. Gets married, marries a local, a fairly local lady. She's from delightfully named Snow Booth, which I think is it's a great name, which is above Hepton Stall. And in the 1870s and the 1880s, he's actually farming at Broadbottom. And in 1895, as we've seen, he purchases the Hollin Hay estate. He passed away, died in 1916 um, of pneumonia. 
Uh, the interesting thing, as I said at the beginning, was his descendants are actually still farming at Hollin Hay, which I found very uh, interesting when I started talking to them. A little bit more of a documentary side of things before we, um, or the brother looking at census returns and that kind of thing. Um, I was identified, it was easy to identify these census for these um, because they're out in the countryside. Then it comes up very clearly that we have uh, Little Hollin Hay and, and uh, Great Hollin Hay. And you can see through as quite a typical picture for upland upland areas that from the 1850s, you might have quite a few people, uh, quite a few families indeed, living um, on the site as you get towards the end of the 19th century. And what if effectively is a bit of a decline in the upland farms. Uh, by 1900, 1901, there are um, only four families living there. In 1911, there are only two families who are actually living there. But of course, that um, will become reflected in what we actually look at in some, in some detail uh, in a minute. Um, if you look back at 1851, for example, they, you have the Halstead family, uh, who we met just now, um, who are farming at Hollin Hay, and in, indeed, both Holland Hayes at, at one stage, all the way through from 1851 to 1891. And these other families, well, the, the other families are living in some of the cottages that are actually attached to the building. We'll get a sight of one or two of those um, a little bit later on. OK, so on, on to um, a little bit more detail about the farms themselves. So as you can see, this is from the, that sale map we saw a little bit earlier. You have... Uh, these two farms sitting together um, on the same site, more or less. Great Hollin Hay here on the left, and that is the building, there's the frontage, if you like, of the building that is the subject of the drawing and the photograph we saw towards the beginning. Little Hollin Hay um, across the, uh, well, what's called the roadway through the farmyard um, on the other side. Unfortunately, we don't have no idea, no one, no one bothered to take a picture of the Little Hollin Hay now there's only one building there left, um, which is a barn, a 19th, 18th century barn that's been converted. So we haven't really got a, a clear idea anymore of um, what Little Holland Hay was actually like. Anyway, we will come along. I just found it rather interesting to they call it a road. <clears throat> this is the road that actually leads down to Holland Hay. Um, it's a flagged path, as you can see, going through it. Probably it would have been, I guess, wide enough for, well, it's certainly for pack horses. Um, it might even, it's very hard to say nowadays because these ways are so great. It, it might even have been possible to have a cart going down there, but I doubt it very much. And a lot of the goods anyway were carried on on pack horses or across the fields on sledges. So you didn't really need a, tra um, a wheeled um, access at all. So, um, very luck in, luckily in, in Halifax and particularly in the township of Sorby, we have also got a number of plans of the township going back um, at least to the beginning of the 19th century. And I thought it was just worth putting these in because as you see on the one on the left there from 1804, it does show um, the two sets of farms. So this is Greater Hollin Hay and on that northern side of the roads. So I turned them around so it's easy to see. And this is Little Hollin Hay here. Um, and it's already interesting to notice that going from the 1804 plan of the township to the 1840s, there has have been some changes. Although Great Hollin Hay doesn't look to have changed very much, but Little Hollin Hay has gained an extra, uh, gained the, the one building there, but it has lost a building that was there in uh, 1804. Now, you know, perhaps not unusual in a way, at a chain time of quite great change in the Calder Valley, that you should have um, buildings coming and going from uh, sites. Nonetheless, I found it um, very interesting. I found the uh, names in the evaluation very interesting as well, the house, barn and cottage and meadow. Um, these there around Little Hollin Hay. And at Great Hollin Hay, we've got the house, barn, garden and a cottage. Um, I'm surprised it's only got one. Then a field called the Bullcroft, presumably, uh, gives a clue to which animal might be there, and an orchard, which I think is really nice as well. Um, you're probably familiar with the uh, OS maps from the middle of the 19th century, I think a brilliant map source. Um, we have a good set of copies of them in the Halifax Local Studies Library. Um, but if you're online, of course, there are very useful maps being put online by the uh, National Library of Scotland. And they have got nearly all of them. 
ironically the one they haven't got one of the ones they haven't got is this one the one around halifax area which is a bit sad but uh, well luckily as i say we have them in in our archives and then we you can see there um in its context the two farms at Holin hay just with one name by the way there just up the, on the uphill side is this one i mentioned dunkirk and that first view that we saw very early on was this, this trackway coming down here um and then on the uh, left hand side of the image there is, is the crag brook the crag vale um this is going coming in downwards southwards and going slowly but surely uphill and the um road that runs along it actually is it's very interesting this is the road that was used on the uh tour de france when the tour de france came uh to calderdale a few years ago um this road here is actually the uh, longest, let me get it right, the longest continuous gradient um, that you can go up. And they used it for the Tour de France to really put them through their paces. Anyway, back to the 19th century. Um, I found that we knew uh, all the field names um, of the Hollin Hayland from the various valuations and things. Very interesting um, names and uh, I distinguished them by their colours so you could see which which belong to uh, which farm. And basically, if you remember that division off the sale map, you've got this division runs roughly down here. These are all the Hollin hay fields, um, uh, greater Hollin hay fields, and these are all the uh, little Hollin hay fields on either side of this uh, dividing line. Some of the clues there about them is very, is very interesting. I'd a tenter field. Well, of course, tenter is for um, hanging out your cloth uh, and Typically in the Calder Valley, many of the settlements or many of the ha farms, uh, farming wasn't necessarily their main occupation. Many of them were involved in the textile trades from, well, from the 15th century onwards. So um, there's a whole history, a whole talk or several talks in, um, just to uh, deal with the development there. And by the time we're looking at here, by the 1850s, of course, the many of the more remote uh, farms were no longer being used. The uh, much of the textile production had moved into the mills, and most of the mills were down in the valley bottoms for water supply um, and a good area of flat land, because we're now talking about sort of large five or six storey mills. Um, we've got the butts there. Well, butts, I mean, the origin of the name certainly is um, for the archery, um, a practicing archery. And I do wonder if that's exactly what these were, that they were the butts that were used for Sorby Township. And to the left of those, we have the Konigar. Well, Kony is an old word for rabbits. So were they actually breeding rabbits up here? I don't, I really don't know. I just haven't got any uh, um, insights into that at all. Um, and then for the lower Hollins, we've got several fields, the lathe field. Lathe is an, another word uh, that uh, people from outside Yorkshire may not be, or uh, the north of England may not be familiar with. A lathe is a combination of an animal house, cow house, and with um, a barn. It's an all-purpose building. And you'll see that's important, as, as you'll see in a little bit about it is we have also a limed field i think that's interesting as well i mean i'm sure all the fields would have been limed why they've actually called this one given a special name um the prevailing um soil around here is pretty sour it's not called sorby for nothing um and uh, the soil around here needs um a, a good application of lime uh, or it did in the 19th century to actually make it uh halfway fertile um, and another that's another reason, of course, why the textile industry was able to take hold here, because the farming was less than profitable. So there we are. There are the fields. Um, and I thought, look at the house, house, uh, the dwellings in a bit more detail in the, from the sale catalogues. And here we have the um, this is the greater Hollin Hay here um, and little Hollin Hay here, I think. But I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I think that the darker shading represents um, the dwelling ends of the buildings. Well, I'm not sure about that because I think this was cottages as well. It's, it's a bit peculiar in this, but this look in the, from the terms of, a, of um, the plan, the footprint of the building, it certainly looks like it might have been a barn. It's quite usual to have a barn with this kind of outshots on either side um, in this area. And certainly that you know, there's no question that the two 
um, plans, the, the planning application, which we'll come to in a minute, um, shows that the building footprints are more or less the same. Although this one has a house labelled there and a barn labelled there, um, which is, isn't quite what things were like, or as far as I can understand it, what, what things were like. Um, and here we go. Some of the drawings uh, from uh, that I was able to photograph when I visited the farm or in uh, last year, no, this year even, yeah, early this year. Um, and these are the drawings that were actually produced uh, because the, um, or rather before um, the application went in for demolishing the building. And now we're quite familiar in these days, in the late, or oh, the early 21st century now, the late 20th century, with people being who wanted to demolish, um, say, a listed building, they're required to put in um, a, an as existing drawing. Well, this is the equivalent of that, but it is very, very rare because most people that wanted to demolish a building in the late 19th century uh, just went ahead and did it. They didn't bother too much about, uh, well, they didn't have to bother too much about uh, getting planning permission. So this is a very unusual feature indeed and that's one i think why i, I got so uh, excited about it um and there are several drawings like this we'll have a look at them in a moment the background seems to be that they were being done by a pupil of the architect who had been employed to design the new farm and the new farm which was to be built from the stone of this these old buildings um, were, was designed by a Halifax architect um, called Joseph Frederick Walsh. He's quite a well-known architect in the Halifax area, um, not so well-known outside the area. He was one of the um, a predominantly um, architect involved in, well, all sorts of buildings. Um, he did a number of houses. There's still a number of his houses standing today in, in the Halifax area. He actually lived on the other side of Halifax in um, Hepperholm. Um, but also of great interest is that he was very interested in older buildings and timber frame buildings. And when a building was moved from the centre of Halifax to stand just outside Shibden Park, um, he was employed by the people that did it at the Lister family um, to actually supervise and design the building. And they took this building down timber by timber and moved it into uh, moved it to this its new site because it, um, Halifax Town Centre was being redeveloped, uh, redeveloped at the time. Um, and Walsh was the architect for it. Um, and this drawing was done by uh, one of his uh, apprentices, one of the people that was apprenticed to him in, in the 1890s. And I think it was done as a, a kind of a college exercise or something like that. Certainly, it's, it's a good picture. It's a good um, representation of the building. Um, and it shows all, all sorts of features. If you remember that doorway with its um, head, headstone there, one or two things aren't quite right, but uh, he's done pretty well. Here's that door on the right hand side, if you remember, I said with the, um, the jams and so on. So a very interesting drawing, very good drawing indeed. Um, and you can see some of the details there. I'm afraid on this, on the left hand side, it's it got a bit blurred, but I thought it was worth putting in because um, you can see um, comparing his drawing with the photograph that he got. You know, it's a, it's a pretty good, pretty good representation. The hood moulding has gone a bit wrong here. Whether he thought it would look better like that, I don't know. Um, but he's got the um, the windows right, more or less, and he's also got the initials and the date over the over the uh, door correct as well. And the date is a surprising one because it's quite early, fifteen seventy two. That is indeed a very early date for the buildings in Calderdale. Um, we have an enormous number of dated buildings in the district. I think I've recorded something like five hundred or six hundred now. Most of them date from the 19th and uh, late 18th into through into the 19th and into the early 20th century. But a substantial proportion also date from the 16th, a uh, few from the 16th, mainly from the 17th century, uh, because there was a kind of a building boom mm. during that time, many buildings being put up uh, through the wealth, mainly of the textile industry. Come back to that in a bit. Um, I, as I say, the, it's an early date. This is Stanley Farm, a little bit further up the Boulder Valley. This is the earliest one that I'm aware of. It's a 1560. Sadly, this date stone has been reset in the wall of a much later building, probably late 18th, 30th, 19th century. But there it is, nonetheless. I'm not exactly sure of the initials. 1560 is the date, fairly clear. 
who Robert Orm was. I just don't know what the PE stand for. It's a bit of a mystery. Don't know much about that. Um, another building, and one I probably people will be familiar with from the front cover of the Rural Houses of West Yorkshire. This is a building in the London Valley, not a million miles from where 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 I am this evening. Um, and this is Peel House. And Peel House, again, if you look carefully, you can see it's got that similar sort of arch over its doorway. Very fine building indeed, restored in the, over the last 20, 30 years. Um, and it's got a very fine door head as well. Um, 1598 on it with a very uh, fancy surrounds going around. But again, with the same sort of shape and that kind of thing. And the initials AW for Anthony Ward, um, the Ward, the, Anthony Wade, I beg his pardon, the Wade family. <clears throat> very important that they were certainly at Peel House for more than 100 years. OK, coming round, going back to our Greater Hollins. So this is the um, the gable end of the house. So the front elevation we were looking at is over there. We've come round the corner here. This is this is the gable end um, with this rather, well, strange wing that you noticed earlier on. And here we've got a good, good set of windows, um, double recessed chamfered mullions and so on and then at the back um kind of outshot uh i'm not sure it doesn't really qualify as an aisle um as you'll see in a minute one other couple of other points just to uh mention the finials very interesting what do you call these bowling finials i don't know must be a good a good name for them and then the copings are terminated in what we call skewbacks so they're mostly um the termination on certainly on later buildings are kneelers, which, which go out horizontally like that and have a little formation there. But skewbacks tend to be uh, tend to be much earlier or tend to be the earlier form that was produced. The rear elevation that he produced as well, and uh, you can see here this the outshot part there with its with its doorway. And then again, a, a doorway with good surrounds, although different, you'll notice from this got a square headed lintel there. Um, and then windows uh, again with hood mold stop hood molds uh, on the top of the building. On the left here, we're looking at the back of the building. Now we've got some some of the other buildings, and I think some of the buildings that probably still survive on the site. Um, very interesting features. I don't know if you noticed it on the the chimney stack at uh, Hollin Hay is uh, one that is diamond set. So it has um, it doesn't form a straight flue going up. We have one that's set as a diamond form. And lo and behold, just down in the village of Mytham Royd, we have another building with a very similar chimney stack indeed. Although I feel this one, Mytham Royd Farm itself, I feel is is um, a fair bit later. I think it's been talking about uh, getting into the early part, early part or perhaps even the mid part of the 17th century. But it's a, a local feature. You see it on several of the buildings um, in various parts of the old parish of Halifax. And I thought it was very interesting that it appears here on Hollin Hay as well. And this guy went into some detail for these drawings, um, I'm, that which made me, uh, convinces me that it is a kind of um, an architectural uh, drawing school uh, set piece that he has to do, that we've got the panelling and showing how the plank and mountain joins together, things like that. It's a fairly rare to get that kind of picture. And then a fireplace as well that he, he drew. Um, very interesting fireplace because I would have expected a fireplace like this, which um, which has this kind of corbel out effect to be, mm, well, late 17th century at the earliest. So perhaps a, um, a change has gone on in, inside the building. And here's a grand plan. I'm sorry, I, this photograph didn't come out particularly well um, and it's difficult to see the features, but I, I think you get the thing that the photographs we've been seeing have been along this front here. Um, and there is your inserted doorway. And what is notable as soon as you see this, and it um, it really stands out, is how narrow this, uh, well, is it a wing? I suppose it's probably a, a bit of a wing anyway, isn't it? Um, uh, the, how narrow this wing is, and which is, uh, when you compare it to the, um, the size of the house, because remember, this is a bit, of, a bit of an outshot at the back there. When you compare it to the um, main range of the house, it's, it's very, very slight in, indeed. Um, and it's quite unusual um, having it that shape. The other things worth pointing out, um, the entrance under that um, arched stonework goes you in, takes you into a kind of a baffle entry. Now, <laughs> that is quite unusual. Uh, and it's certainly unusual in the, in the for a 16th century house um, in Calderdale. We 
as you, I'll show you in a minute, we've got some, a lot of houses in the area across passage plans. Uh, this one appears not to be. Um, it appears to be something a little bit different. However, I think the things have changed around because over here on the right hand side, we have what looks like a pretty prominent fireplace and beside it an oven, oh, sorry, beside it an oven that uh, it strikes me that that might at one time have been the main fireplace in the room. And this is some, something that comes on a little bit later. So it as at least two things that make me think that, you know, perhaps this building has been uh, changed about quite a bit uh, um, and you're not necessarily seeing the clues in the outside of it. Nonetheless, we get a good idea of what the plan of the building was like. Um, and I think probably this plan um, already reflects the fact that the building has been um, subdivided because we have not only a staircase here, which you see pretty clearly, um, it's pretty clear that this end of the building and that form one unit and this bit here with, its, with the inserted door form a second unit. So we've got a, sub, a house that's been subdivided. When that happens, I, we have basically no idea. My guess is by looking at the jams on the door by right there that it was probably uh, subdivided um, around 1800. Let's say that that's a, a bit, bit of a, you know, a, a rough guess at it. He also did a section. Wow, wonderful, you say. A section that actually is uh, looking north along the building. Um, and I've drawn the most, use the photograph and basically we're looking up the building that way. You can see the wing poking out here. Um, and this showing the span of the building. And then, which is, again, something quite typical in the buildings around here from yeah from this kind of date for quite a long time forward that though you may have stone walls you still have more it's more or less an internal timber frame structure um there are no posts you haven't uh, uh for the for carrying the roof uh the roof is carried on the walls um but then above that uh, you have the tie beam fine king post and then these vertical studs in infilling there um, and then this plank and munting uh, dividing off the rooms and then a, f a very fine doorway there with an OG door head, a G shaped door head. Uh, and so, it's, you know, it's a very, uh, very interesting building. It's, it's this kind of um, midway between the timber frame tradition and getting into a fully stone built building. Um, the first floor, <laughs> quite intriguing in a way. Um, the first floor part of it, um, the stairs coming up there in this this part of the building, um, stairs coming up there in this part of the building, um, and written across this area at the top here is uh, no door into this room. It's got a window, but no door. And that seems to me to be very strange, but I don't think there's any chance of solving exactly what was going on um, in that room, why there was no door to it. Particularly, there's no other opening apart from the window either. Anyway, that's the first floor plan I've just written on where it says trust. This is what is actually written there, but on the photographs, it didn't, didn't come out well enough. So we get an idea of what the first floor was like there with a small fireplace, if you remember, above that um, uh, large fireplace downstairs with the oven. But here we have no fireplace upstairs at all. We have just a stack running through, um, running up through the rooms. <clears throat> And I just said just now that, you know, this is this building clearly is untypical for the area. Um, many of the buildings in the Calder Valley, um, having been studied in, in some detail by Christopher Stell back for, in the 19, uh, late 1950s for his, um, his doctorate, no, not his doctorate, his master's thesis in 1960, um, and then studied by a um, couple of uh, decades later by the team from uh, the Washington for the uh, West Yorkshire Archaeology Service, working with the Royal Commission, <clears throat> actually producing um, the, the West Yorkshire, Rural Houses of West Yorkshire book that I showed you the cover of earlier. <clears throat> and the conclusion is that uh, many of the houses in this area and in other areas, of course, but in particularly in Calderdale, um, of this form with a cross passage, so a passageway running across the building and then sort of variations on the theme and there are several themes like it um this is a bit of a simplification based on christopher stell's work um quite often you have an aisle at the rear here so and where the covers the service end because at the other end you've got a workshop this is where the textile manufactory or whatever was going on the more elaborate ones have the parlor and a parlor um 
or service end uh, on the other wing, giving you an idea of what the what the building was like. Um, and again, a cross passage form on the right hand side here with the kitchen wing to the rear. This is actually Peel House um, as it happens. But we also get houses with a kind of lobby entry plan. And this is, in a way, what's, that one is more, this uh, Pollen Hay is more, a bit more like this, although we haven't got an elaborate parlour either. And it's just by way of kind of try to, trying to put the thing in its context. So it's an unusual building. So there's no two ways about it. So just as a summary, um, <clears throat> Um, we're on the south side of my uh, in the old township of Sorby. We've got the sale details and drawings of one of the buildings. OK, so now we're going to go on and look at what happened. Mr. Helliwell, having purchased the building, takes it into his head that he what he will do is, is combine the fields. Um, and rather than have his farm buildings here, um, which is basically right at the on the, up, the uphill side, of all the land, he's going to recite his farm. And this is the farm that moved downhill here. This is a greenfield site in one of the fields. Um, and what his plan is, and what happens basically, is that he takes down the old farm building, we saw the picture of those, and reuses the stone in the building here. Um, I thought it was worth showing this because although it's difficult to see the detail on the plan, um, here's the text of it, this is the rock plan, and it's signed by the chairman, um, Joseph Ashton, he's the chairman of the newly formed Urban District Council. They're, so they're very keen in uh, 1896 of making sure that the buildings have the correct sewerage. And that's basically what this plan is about. It's about how the sewerage is going to be dealt with from these houses, because they actually, of course, their origins are in the sewage bo sewerage boards and water and sewerage boards of the 19th century, because, of course, one of the main concerns was the um, very high death rates that were um, resulting because of the poor disposal of sewage. Anyway, we have a bit more of a, um, a look at the detail of it. And as this is the one that bit about with the house and the barn came. I'm not quite sure why they put it like that, because it's clear that this was this was a house, a dwelling, and that was a dwelling. But maybe by the time Mr. when Mr. Halliwell took over, the tenancies were changed and they were using this as just as houses and this bit maybe as a barn. But I don't really know the answer to that and down here is the uh the new build our new building going going to be put further down the hill and as i say i found in the calderdale archives they had the actual building plans for the place it was a moment of and when i found this on the archivist brought it out my uh, my heart stopped because it was on that very very and if you've come across it, this very brittle paper and the paper, if you as you unfolded it, it started to split. And if you can see that in these joins here and I thought they're going to come over in a minute and say you can't unfold that. You mustn't do that because you're, you're ruining the thing. But they were they were quite happy for me to uh, <laughs> carry on, carry on doing that. Um, and here you can see we have um, various drawings of the building itself. Um, and then there were several other pla uh, other drawings, which I actually we did manage to. Put, um, get reasonable photographs of. I say that because, as you'll see, the folds um, play a predominant part in the new plans. Anyway, here's the front elevation of our new building. Um, we have at one end then the house part of the building, um, and he is reusing the stone. And as you'll see in a little bit, he's reused that um, stone from above the doorway at Greater Hollins, um, and then a barn, and a, or more correctly, a lathe attached. So the lathe is this combination of um, a building for, for the animals and a storage for all crops and hay, and that kind of thing. And indeed, what if you look at it carefully, you can see that as this is all one build, it actually qualifies as a lathe house. So this is a type of building that we're far more um, uh, familiar with for the say the late 18th and the 19th century um, it was at a time when um, it, trying to build e farms economically on some of the newly enclosed lands that uh, lathe houses came into their own where you have the in one build you have both the farmhouse um, and the um, building for the animals and for storage of the crops which in a way is that it's sort of getting, going back to much earlier times um, and here it is in its in real life what actually turned up um, and I think it's very interesting to sort of compare the compare both the um, building um, and its picture and that kind of thing. This is much more typical of a lathe house. Um, it's a mid, uh, no, early, uh, where are we, 1831 um, building 
from uh, the Worley Township, which is a neighbouring township to Sorby. It's in the London Valley. Um, and this is from the Rural Houses book uh, and showing what you would expect a typical layout with the lathe end here where the cattle or um, hay will be stored or would be. And then the farm with the house body um, and a scullery and a dairy at the back of the farm. This is a very small one, but um, quite typical of some of the buildings that were being built in on the new land. Back to our drawings of Hollin Hay then. This is the new, new Hollin Hay and looking in a bit more detail at the house itself. Um, and I think you, if you compare the two and sit here for a little bit looking at it, um, the plans uh, were reproduced by the builders pretty, pretty faithfully. You have this rather unusual arrangement. They've reused the arch-headed windows, but placed them um, in this way above a much larger light. Um, and you can see the thinking there, can't you, that they are actually going to use larger lights on it. Here's our doorway. There's our doorway again. We've seen this picture before. There is the old archway and here is the new archway. Um, but Mr. Halliwell has uh, left his mark on the buildings by putting above the old archway and incorporating it in here. 1896 rebuilt by uh, Edward Halliwell. And there we are. This is uh, this is the new one and with a um, little, I think that's a modern one, I can't remember, but I think that's a fairly modern thing. Go around the other side, and we have here's the back view of the building. Here are the double doors leading into where the hay would be stored and so on. It's very interesting, as you'll see in a moment, the mist hall um, is accessed through these doors. And the house has also two rear doors, and that will be clear in a minute why that, why that is. Um, uh, yeah, let me just carry on. There is the building itself in, uh, in, in life, in earlier on this year. Um, again, this similar uh, use of these round-headed windows, but uh, mounting them above a, <coughs> a transom, I suppose that becomes, and so you can have larger panes, larger glass underneath them. Um, yep, that's just comparing the two. Then the plans, and they, the plans are very interesting because here we have our lathe house uh, with the house end at this end, um, and here we have the standing for the animals, unusually running all the way along the long wall of the house. That's, that's fairly unusual to have it like that. They're more often at one end or at the other or both ends sometimes. We have a stable in one corner and the barn area um, at the other end. The farm no longer has um, cattle as such. They sheep use these um, pens here for sheep shearing now, which I think is a very interesting uh, transition into the in the 21st century. Here is um, the living area in the house. Um, it's very interesting. Here's the front door, remember. On the one hand, we have the parlour, the living room, um, and to the rear, the kitchen. Um, and when we look at the first floor plan, it suddenly becomes clear that because you have two staircases in here, they are clearly incorporating an area for um, a living housekeeper or servants in, in their house. So we have the... Um, main stairs coming up here with the passageway and the uh, one end of the house this end of the house here is actually subdivided off as you'll see that area there is actually just subdivided off the wall running here through here and there's no no access between the two parts of the house <clears throat> in the cellar ah, what did i find but old timbers and i was really pleased to see there were still some old timbers because the trusses are all new in the uh, over the barn and the house um but in the in the cellar they reuse some of the oak timbers with moldy decorations um from the old house they were used on their side in the cellar which i thought well fair enough they've used them they've reused them so here's your cellar um which is only under part of the house the downhill part of the house with these stairs accessed from the main stairs one or two other features you may, may remember i pointed out the finial um, on the house is it one from the barn we have a very sharp um, apex there as well an apex stone um, and not aligning at all with the uh, line of the roof here and so they're probably from the barn and then a, a ventilator here as well this is looking back along the farmyard looking north and lo and behold some mason's marks as well so as I say, all my Christmases are coming at once. Um, here's a very good um, example of the Mason's marks with these uh, four triangles joined together. But if you look carefully at that drawing, uh, or that uh, photograph, I should say, you can see there are several other Mason's marks there. They're there, they're there, they're there. Once you get your eye in, you can see Mason's marks on many of the pieces of stone. 
Um, even one like this beside the doorway. So there's there's a, a doorway on the back elevation and a, a stone with a mason's mark in, which I'm take to be a real confirmation of that this was, you know, rebuilding using the stone. Even some of the stone was used here in the pigsties and the um, outbuildings here on the uh, east side of the farm, on the upper side, on the uphill side. And in inside, I thought this was a wonderful feature. I didn't take, I have taken one or two inside pictures. I rather, I feel um, kind of a bit of intrusive if I show them. Um, but this one I think is well worth showing because we've got a lovely panel door here with illustrations of, um, well, buildings inside there. And it make, I was amazed to look at this building because it is none other than, you can see it in a bit more detail, a picture showing Broadbottom Farm. And here is Broadbottom Farm on the right hand side. There's the Gable building, Gable building there. And this is this line of houses. So Edward Helliwell clearly felt um, almost nostalgic, perhaps, for uh, Broadbottom Farm because he incorporated it in his new house um, at uh, Hollin Hay, the farm that was down the hill. Another picture of Broad Bottom, just to show you, it, it's a, it was a, it is still a very interesting building. Um, this part was timber framed originally, um, with aisle front and back, um, cased in stone. So, quite an interesting one. Even more interesting still, when I sat down with the family to talk to them, um, I found out that they still use field names. Now, I, I didn't think that was particularly familiar, um, but the, they sat down with me and said, oh, yes, we call the fields by different names. Um, and some of the names have a real uh, old ring to them. The, the three nooked fields, a three cornered field. Um, this was the tenter field, if you remember, long up at the top, mm, different, you know, very descriptive. But over here, we have a field they called the Coney Garth. And they didn't know, you know, why do we call that the Coney Garth? I had no idea. But of course, it links in with what was called the Coney, I think, was it Coney Garth? I can't remember offhand. The, the Coney um, one on the old plan. And this field here is called the Old Robert. And how on earth did that name arise? It happens that the chap who was actually uh, farming at Little Hollin Hay when the farm was taken over, um, when the, the changed hands of the tenant, was actually called Robert Holstead. So I just don't know if that name has actually had, had some kind of thing. Anyway, that's the story, more or less, of the farm that moved. Um, there's a lot more to it and the descent of the family and so on like that. But basically what happened is that this farm here, or these two farms here, one of them was taken down and it ended up here at Hollin Hay Farm. Thank you, I say, to everyone who's helped in the research, particularly the family. Their name is now Hay, so I've got the Hay family of Hollin Hay. Well, I hope you found that interesting. <clears throat>